Okay, want to get started? Hey, welcome to the session, Advanced Mixed Reality Development and Best Practices. Uh, so in this session, I'm going to talk about my top 10 developer recommendations for mixed reality, like HoloLens, but also a lot of these apply to devices like a Magic Leap and also mobile augmented reality you have on a phone, right? And we will do a little bit um, de uh, deep dive into the top Two, spoiler, it is about uh, mixed reality and combining it with deep neural networks for object recognition. And uh, top one, which I'm really excited about, we will spend a good amount of time on that. It's about building cross-platform mobile AR applications with Azure Spatial Anchors. And I will also explain this industry term that is evolving about the AR cloud, the augmented reality cloud, because this is super exciting technology that will definitely transform how we interact with the real world around us. Using devices like this or your mobile phone, you know, these can sense the real world around you, and uh, we will talk about this and the AR cloud, how that actually will change quite a bit. So that will actually be a lot about mobile AR. So I'm not going to do an intro to AR and VR and all of that development since it's an advanced topic, um, but I have a bunch of presentations I did before, so I will have at the end of the slide deck a, a slide with all the links to previous sessions as well as uh, further information, including the source code for the demos I'm going to show you. So there will be a slide at the end. You can take a photo and get the, the stuff all from there. Um, I'm not going to do any live coding here. I will show you some of the sessions. I will show you the, the demos and all of that. You will get the source code all in GitHub, because I think it's rather you know, annoying to watch someone type and make typing errors. I rather want to spend the time you know, explaining to you the concepts and the higher level things. Cool, cool. Um, so my name is Rene. I'm Director of Global Innovation at Valorum Reply. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with Microsoft range from backend like Azure cloud computing uh, over data science, data analytics, to things like the front end and immersive and things like HoloLens. So I've been working with the HoloLens since 2015, but even before that we did a lot of mobile AR based applications. I'm also Microsoft Regional Director and MVP. These are basically awards that Microsoft provides to independent experts that share their knowledge. And so I'm very active in the community, right? And recently I was asked to join the Global Advisory Board of the VR and AR Association. So I'm part of that as well, which is an independent organization that tries to foster collaboration in our virtual and augmented reality industry. All right, so let's get started. We're going from 10 to 1. And it says treat the HoloLens as a mobile device. And that also applies to devices like a Magic Leap, but also in general to, uh, you know, of course, mobile devices like mobile AR, mobile phone-based devices, right? And if you look at these, um, they are, of course, limited in terms of rendering power, right? So you don't have a beefy computer that you can run all the computing and all the rendering on top of. So you've got to keep in mind that you have a, a limited rendering uh, budget in the end. And things like a HoloLens, for example, are really much fill rate bound, which means is if you render virtual content very close to the eye of the user, to the camera, it fills a lot of pixels. And so if you have an expensive pixel shader running there, it will drop the frame rate quite dramatically. So you want to keep that in mind, have a simple pixel shader, have a simple lighting model if you run it on the device. And of course, also polygons, right? So when we work with clients, they often give us CAT models, like CAD models from the engineering departments. And they just say, hey, you can use the model. We have it already. Just put it on device. And, it's like, and they give you like a 100 million polygon model, which of course would never run on such a device because it does all the computing on here, right? It does not do the computing on a PC. So there are solutions for actually reducing the mesh, reducing the polygonal size. And uh, I did a talk at the VR AR Summit just for that topic that did a deep, deep dive. But in general, uh, you can categorize it into uh, different things like automatic mesh reduction. There are tools available like SimpliGon. Another one is Pixies by Unity, which is really good. And then there are things like this here, Umbra. And Umbra from Finland, in fact, they have a solution for dynamic level of detail. So what it basically does, it takes a large model, like this here is originally a 20 million polygon model, and it you know, pre-processes that. And then when you, when you run it on the device, like a HoloLens here, it will actually fetch in the data dynamically, dynamic level of detail, as, as it's called. Uh, it also does occlusion culling, which basically means, like for these skyscrapers, the stuff that is behind these skyscrapers, the polygons are not seen anyway, but they're actually not sending them to the GPU, right? And here you see level of detail in action again. You look closely, it fetches in the data, and then you know, shows you more details after that. So this way you can actually render much larger models, right? But as you can see, there are still some artifacts. 
And so if that is not something feasible for your clients that they say, hey, we don't want to have these artifacts, we want to have the full model. There's another option, it's called remote rendering. And what that basically does is it, it renders the scene not on a device like this, but actually on a computer, and then streams the rendered frames back. So take a look at this. Uh, this here is Unity running in the background. You might be able to see it here on the computer. And yeah, again, that scene runs in Unity, and I'm wearing the HoloLens. So I'm recording that while wearing the HoloLens. And so what remote rendering does, it takes all the input from the device, like the hand tracking plus the head rotation and the position, so that's six stuff tracking. All of that input is sent to the computer, here in this case in Unity. Unity computes the scene and then streams back a video to the device for the left and the right eye. And therefore, you're just limited by the amount you can compute on your PC, right? And with a recent update, uh, Unity 2018, they actually now support it that you don't have to run it in Unity. So you can actually run it on in a you know, separate application, like a UWP, Universal Windows Platform application, right? So take a look at this video. I'm just opening an app. So I don't start Unity here. I'm just opening an app I, I created. And as you can see, it runs on a PC and does the remote rendering in front at the HoloLens. And the cool part with that is, of course, you cannot ship Unity to your clients, right? But you can give them an application. So they can run that. And also, you might notice the lag is a little bit uh, less. So it's a uh, better latency as well. Right? And there's another option uh, in a private preview at the moment. It's called Azure Remote Rendering. They, again, just private preview, whether actually uh, rendering these scenes not on a beefy PC you have somewhere, actually they're rendering on these beefy GPU cloud computers, right? Some server with some graphics card. Um, in a private preview, also will just work on the HoloLens 2, but uh, pretty exciting, definitely. And somewhat they're using the late state reprojection of the HoloLens 2 to actually get rid of the latency. Because as you can imagine, it all depends on the latency, right? If you, have a, uh, you need to have a pretty good network connection. But if you have that, it's actually a pretty feasible solution to use remote rendering. So that works with Unity. And here you actually see a HoloLens 2. And with the HoloLens 2, they now also support Unreal Engine. And here's a quick demo that shows you a pretty impressive piece from the Apollo 11 mission uh, they created for the HoloLens 2 with Unreal, and that is actually using remote rendering with Unreal. So you can render your whole scene in Unreal with high fidelity, with a super amazing quality. So you can see the shaders, the light reflection, the shadings, um, also depth of field and all these effects that would never be possible on such mobile devices, right? And so, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. I can see here depth of field, all these effects. Um, and again, rendered on a PC, then streamed back as a stereo video for the left and the right eye back to the computer. You have a question? Uh-huh. Yeah. So let me repeat the question. So I was wondering, like, if you walk around, you know, and it's streaming back the video, how would you see these changes in the video, kind of? And it does real-time rendering. So what it does, it takes the input data from the device, including the six stuff tracking, right? So where you are currently, and also the hand input, and streams that back in real time to the computer. The scene is recreated or re-rendered the frame, and then for the left and right eye, a video stream back. And therefore, it requires a pretty good network, and you need to keep in mind latency, of course, right? If you have lots of animations, it can be a challenge, of course. Oh yeah, you need a proper PC. But if you compare like these kind of, like I have a laptop here that has an NVIDIA 1080 graphics card. I could easily render that one on, on this machine, right? So we're rather limited by, by these guys. Yep, another question. What do you mean? I don't understand. So let's say it's not rendered on this page. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the tracking and all of that still works with the device. So basically, if you, if you move around, the object will stay there. And it takes the input data, it takes the six stuff tracking data, where you are in the room with that device, streams it back. And so basically, this, this is driving a virtual camera on your PC, right? So you have a virtual camera in Unity that is then being rendered. Well, then it will be stuck, right? So, yeah. This is local, so you can have a local computing, right, on a, on a computer like here, or you could do it with Azure Remote Rendering in the cloud. And you need to have a proper network connection, of course, right? 
you'll basically stream in real-time video. Okay, um, make good use of the HoloLens 2 instinctual input. What is that, actually? So the HoloLens 1 supported just these kind of input, right? You can do like this, tap, that's pretty much it. But with the HoloLens 2, they have actually a pretty cool thing, which is called instinctual input, or just call it a full articulated hand tracking. So they can track the whole hand, or both hands, of course. So you can do like things like this. And what I'm saying here with make good use of that, uh, you can get the raw finger tracking data, in fact, with the HoloLens 2. But if you want to do that, hmm, you might want to keep that in mind that you actually uh, want to use the Mixed Reality Toolkit, which you can see here. So this is an open source project which provides you a lot of functionality already, including you know, basically an abstraction layer for the full articulated hand tracking so that you can use all of these controls and, and all of that and don't have to worry about it. And it's actually cross-platform as well. So make good use of the Mixed Reality Toolkit and its instinctual input that has support for. Design your UI for 3D. But before we go into that, so I, I have a HoloLens 1 here with me. The HoloLens 2 is just about to ship to enterprise customers. So unfortunately, I couldn't bring it in time. Uh, but it's really, it's happening. So the HoloLens 2 is coming out, so don't worry about that. Uh, I've, I know a lot of you have been probably waiting for it, but yeah, it's happening. But let's talk about number seven, design your UI for 3D. So what I still see often these days is you have these amazing devices that can render stereo 3D, right? You see 3D content with stereographic rendering. Um, but then they have UI panels that are just flat panels, just 2D panels, which is kind of annoying. Because we live in a 3D world, we want to render 3D content, so please, let's use a 3D user interface as well. Um, it might take a little bit more effort, but things like the Mixed Reality Toolkit make it actually a little bit easier, because they already have 3D buttons and all of that built in, right? Also, you've got to keep in mind the constraints of these devices. So for the HoloLens 2, we have quite a larger field of view, like a screen size. But for the HoloLens 1, as you see, it's like this. So you always just see like a window like that, right? A holographic frame, as it is called. And so you've got to design your application in the right way so that it fits into these constraints, because you cannot actually change the hardware, right? So here's a sample. We built this application for Bridgestone to render a virtual tire. And you can see when the user wants to place the model, we actually don't allow them to place it too close to the user. As you see, it turned red. And if you move it a little bit further out, we allow it to place there, and then you have the podium with the tire. And that will basically ensure that the user will see the full tire when, when it launches, right? So they will see the full tire in the, in the frame, in the field of view. And then you can always walk closer to it anyway, right? So keep that in mind, uh, design your UI well for the constraints and for a 3D setting. And you know what? You can actually design your UI in 3D for 3D, which is pretty cool. And there is a tool called Maquette from Microsoft, which is a virtual reality application. So you put on a VR headset and you can design your UI in that. So you have some pretty cool tools with the controllers, as you can see, uh, supports the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, and of course, the Windows Mixed Reality Immersive headsets, the virtual reality ones, right? And the good part is you can, when so done designing your UI, you can actually then export that into a 3D scene, which you can then import in your 3D modeling tool or in Unity. So pretty nice. Or oh, here's another thing. It's called a looking glass. It's a 3D volumetric display. And that allows you to see 3D content without having to wear any 3D stereo glasses. So if you take a look at this video, I recorded it just with my cell phone, which of course doesn't have any stereo glasses. But take a look at the cube when I rotate my phone around the screen. It is really rendering 3D content, right, on this looking glass display. And so this one is just 9 inch, like this. Pretty limited resolution, limited viewing angle, right? But it, it's still quite early for this kind of technology, but definitely amazing. And here you can see uh, my beautiful wife and our uh, holographic streaming solution called Holobeam running on that. So she's basically standing in front of a 3D camera like a Kinect, and we can stream that live. And so you can see when I rotate the phone, it's in fact showing you 3D content there. And the cool part with that looking glass is actually, so you can use it just as a consumer, but you can also use it as a developer. Because when you, when you connect it to your PC, it's basically just an external monitor, and they have a plugin for Unity as well as Maya and other 3D authoring tools. So you can actually see the 3D content, not just on your 2D screen, but on this 3D screen real time, which helps a lot to get a good sense for the spatial awareness of that. And just real fresh this morning from Twitter, this video, they just shown in Japan at an expo an 8K resolution of the looking glass. So look where, where the journey is going, right? That's pretty impressive, isn't it? 
And again, it's much larger than the 9-inch. You see the 9-inch also over there. So a lot of progress happening in that space. And there are multiple companies working in that. That's again looking glass, all the photos they had. And uh, definitely, a, definitely an impressive device and also useful if you're doing 3D design work. Yep, uh, let your apps live in the real world. And what I mean here is these devices, like a HoloLens, has a bunch of sensors, a depth camera as well. So it can understand the room a little bit. It can measure the distance to objects, right? It can do a so-called spatial reconstruction. But that does not just apply to the HoloLens. It's also on these modern mobile devices, which when I say modern, that's a Samsung S8, and it even runs AR core pretty well. I'm going to show you a live demo over there. But anyway, even your mobile phone devices can sense the real world around you, and they can reconstruct surface planes. So you will actually know where to put your content. And so make them spatially aware of your applications. Don't just show a 3D virtual overlay in front of the user, right? Put them on a table. Put them like on a chair or something like that. Make them part of the reality, right? And so here's an example. Uh, you can hardly see it, but there's a tire here, right here, a real physical tire. And this gentleman, my colleague Justin, he looked at this physical tire, and then we're using a piece called Bavoria Model Targets, which allows us to find the location and orientation of that real-world tire. And keep in mind, there's no QR code, no AR marker on the tire. We use the real physical object. So how does it work? It takes a 3D model of the tire. You run it through the Bavoria Model Targets processing pipeline, which basically extracts some metadata for the pattern matching. And then it will, it will match this tire on the real object. And then you can have this truly mixed reality experience, you know, where it's expanding it on the real physical object. And it's really part of that real world. And you don't have to have any ugly AR markers or stickers applied to this one, right? Uh, keep a couple of things in mind when you want to use these kind of things. First of all, it needs to fit into the rendering budget of the device. So you cannot just use a full-blown CAT model, right? It will just take too long to actually match it. Um, second, you also need to experiment a little bit what you take as part of the 3D model for the pattern matching. And third, you also can see we mounted a light bulb up there um, so we get a little bit more contrast. So, of course, it's using computer vision, right? You need to provide it some kind of uh, useful uh, tracking data. But anyway, let your apps not just use the AR sticker effect, but let them live in the real world. Um, let it focus and stay anchored. So there's a thing with the HoloLens and also with other devices. It has an API called Stabilization Plane. And what it is, it's basically this red plane you can see here. So it's a 3D plane, which is a point and a normal. And by default, the stabilization plane is two meters away but, and pointing to the camera, to the user, basically. But you can also manually say, OK, I want to have the stabilization plane at that particular point. And I'm going to show you a really nice thing with the device portal. And the device portal is basically, well, it's a thing with Windows 10 where you can uh, use uh, remotely uh, you know, analyze a computer, basically. So you can use a browser, open device portal, and can basically control the HoloLens or any other Windows 10 machine, because it's a Windows 10 machine. And so there's a cool thing here, which allows you to actually uh, debug the scene and uh, you know, visualize the stabilization plane here. So you can actually visualize the stabilization plane. This is this red plane. And if you look at the dog here, it will actually snap to it, right? And so this virtual dog, this, this uh, hologram of this dog, will be the most stable one. Or if you have the cat in the view, it will actually attach it to it. So definitely make use of that, because a lot of people actually don't use it. The good thing is with Unity 2017 and the rather OS4 update of the HoloLens, so that was an update last year, uh, they also support depth buffer sharing, which basically allows you to read out the depth buffer, find the closest object, and set a stabilization plane automatically there. And you really want to use a stabilization plane, because every object that intersects with that plane will be the most stable one. It won't jitter. Otherwise, if it's like too far away from the plane, it will jitter. It will give you an uncomfortable experience. So you really want to make use of that. And that's a good way. And it's often not talked about, but it's a really important API, actually. And you can use anchors, like world anchors. And we're going to talk much more in detail later on. So I'm not going to explain what a world anchor is, but I'm just going to show you that you can also visualize them here, show spatial anchors. And then you see these little uh, coordinate systems, these gizmos. This is for the dog, and this is for the cat. And it will basically make sure that these objects don't move. But again, more about that later on. Share your holograms with the world. Well, what I mean here is, if you build these amazing applications, you actually want to sh uh, you know, share them with people. 
And for Windows and for the HoloLens, you have the Windows Store, so you can upload applications there. And we do that actually a lot for you know, public marketing reasons, so everyone can download that. Or also we use these private deployments where you basically have this application not listed and you can just whitelist certain users so only your clients can actually download that. But it's a great way for deploying it. You know, instead of giving them an AppX package or whatever binary they need to sideload, you can just send them to the store, give them a link, they can download it from there. It's a really good way. And of course you can record videos and the HoloLens has a thing built in called MRC, which is Mixed Reality Capture. So it has a little camera here, well, it has a bunch of other cameras, but this is the one you can use. And this camera <coughs> can be used to record the scene plus the virtual content on top of that. Uh, has a couple of downsides. Uh, first of all, it slows down the frame rate from 60 frames per second to 30 frames per second, because they basically do a real-time video encoding on the device. Takes a little bit of resources. Um, then, the blending is also not like you, it really is with the whole lens. So as you can see, I mean, these devices with these um, you know, see-through displays, they actually do additive blending, which basically means the virtual content you see here is adding light to the scene, right? So it's additive blending. But with the MRC, it's actually alpha blending, what it's recorded. So it's not really the same. And also, it's just a small, really tiny camera. So it's really grainy and not that great resolution. So as you can imagine, there's a better solution. Um, which is called Spectator View, and we built our own, which we call Mirror, Mixed Reality Observer. So what you do here is you take a really good camera, like a DSLR here, or here's another one, and you attach a whole lens to it, but you actually just use the whole lens for the tracking information. So you just use the whole lens to get the, the six stuff, the position and the rotation of that camera. And so below here, we actually got rid of the whole lens and just use an HTC Vive tracker, which costs $100, much cheaper, and that gives us the sixth off position of the camera. So we have the position of that real world camera, right? Which we're recording the scene with. Then we stream that to a computer and similar like remote rendering. We have our virtual camera then driven in the scene and then render that scene on a computer and can get much better resolution, much better uh, quality as you can see here. And just recently they launched a new version. It's called Spectator View Mobile, which is pretty cool because it actually runs on an iOS device or Android device. So you can render the exact same scene that you people see in the HoloLens on these mobile devices. And as you know, they have pretty good cameras these days. So you can just use a mobile phone to record the scene or live stream that and get much better quality if you would, as if you would use the MRC. And actually, that is using Azure Spatial Anchors as well, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Well, be part of a global community. Well, you're already here, so you already did one step. That's great. Um, but I just wanted to point you out to this URL where you can find full information, so aka.ms slash mr, and that leads you to a pretty good website there, which uh, provides you more information about, uh, for example, the Slack channel. So there's a pretty good Slack channel with all the experts on it, so if you want to do any mixed reality development, definitely join the channel, all nice people, all uh, you know, helping and so on. Also here on Twitter, you can find their channel uh, where you can always ask questions. Uh, really nice folks there that always are happy to help, right? And then you have also some information about if you want to get started, lots of tutorials, all of that. But definitely be part of the global community because it's a small community at the moment, right? We're all just trying to help each other and definitely join that. It's, it's good fun. Um, learn about deep learning. Well, you guess what I mean here, right? Learn about how to leverage deep neural networks. And so let me explain it a little bit. With Windows 10, there was a new um, API introduced, which is called Windows uh, Machine Learning, actually with RS4. That's an update from April last year. And that is pretty interesting, because it allows you to run deep neural networks on the device, also on the HoloLens, with hardware acceleration even. So WinML, as you can see here, supports a couple of different uh, you know, hardware, so it's CPU and GPU. So it can actually take advantage of a GPU and run your deep neural network much, much faster, right? And so the workflow is actually can be pretty cool because if you use like a cloud computing solution like Azure ML or um, Azure Cognitive Services Custom Vision, you can easily create these uh, deep learning models. It's actually a website, you upload a bunch of photos, give them a label, hit a button, train, it trains it, and then you can export that trained model so you can use a web API, of course, to use it, but you can also export that model 
Uh, for iOS, as Core ML, for Android, TensorFlow Lite, or even now TensorFlow JS, so you can even run it on the website, locally on the client then, right? And Onyx, ONNX, and that's an open standard that is evolving, uh, mainly driven by Microsoft, but also a couple of industry uh, companies that is you know, a standard for these kind of pre-trained neural networks, or in general, neural network models. And so you can train in the cloud, and then take that model, export that, and put it on a device like this, and have super short latency, right? So you don't need to send all the frames to the to cloud and wait until you get the evaluation results back. You can actually run it on the device and you know, use best of the both worlds. And so here's an example, and again, you will get the source code. I have a link at the end on GitHub. And so that runs on the HoloLens. And what I did here, I took a deep learning model, a squeeze net model, which is a pretty compact, small model, trained that with some custom images, mainly the ImageNet database, but also some custom images there, and use that and have it run on the HoloLens. Let's take a look. This might be a car wheel 3.5 meter in front of you. So it analyzes the camera frames I'm putting into the neural network, and then I get a prediction back, right? This might be a matchstick 1.1 meter in front of you. And it also uses the spatial mapping. This is mapping. likely a minibus 3.1 meter in front so of you. So for the distance, like 3.5 meters, right? I'm using just a depth camera. This is likely a Volkswagen Multivan Generation 6, 3.2 meter in front of you. So you can use that, you know, for you know, empowering people that, you know, have low vision, for example. But you can also use it for training. This is likely a car mirror 96 centimeter in front of you. If you don't know what it is, just use the device. It also works on mobile, right? It tells you what it is and how you can assemble it. This might well, be like, a hammer I mean, we all know what a hammer is, right? But think about there could be some specialized tools on the oil rig. And people come there first day to put this on device. This is likely a black and decker steps, power drill, 82 centimeter it. in front of you. And you can also include your favorite beer brand. This might be a Raid Burger beer bottle, 1.2 meter and in have front a long of you. Arm. Well, it might be a bit too early to pop a bottle. This might be a notebook, later, 84 centimeter in front of you. But you get the you. idea, right? You can run these deep neural network models on the device. And here's a really nice thing about it. Uh, with the HoloLens 1, it, they only had, uh, with the HoloLens 1 and the RS4 update, when they first introduced the WinML support, uh, it only had CPU support. So you had like 700, under 700 milliseconds uh, because it was running on a CPU. And it did a pretty nice thing with the RS5 update in October with bringing in a DirectX 12 driver for a uh, HoloLens 1, which is pretty old now. And so if you have a DirectX 12 driver, WinML can run your deep learning model on the GPU. So you get like four or five times faster, as you can see, 180 milliseconds, right? So again, I mean, if you think about it, it's 2015, something like that, the HoloLens 1. It can still run these in near real time. Now think about if I would run it on the HoloLens 2 or other devices that are much more powerful these days. <clears throat> All right, here. So let's talk about the AR cloud and why you should care about building cross-platform shared experiences. But let me step back for a moment. What, what is this AR cloud? What is all of that stuff you might have heard about, Azure Spatial Anchors and so on? So pretty much everyone has their own terminology at the moment. It's just with AR, VR, XR, MR, spatial computing, and so on. It's similar with the AR cloud. And here's a video from Facebook Research. They're working on that as well. They call it Facebook Life Maps. But they do a pretty good job in the video explaining it. So you have these devices that can spatially understand the world around us, right? And so you can have these 3D scans, basically, of the physical world. And the AR cloud is basically a digital twin or a digital copy of this physical world around us, right? And we don't just have it from one device, but from multiple devices. So we get a full copy of that, right? And so Facebook's working on that, obviously, in the research lab. Um, then you have the Magic Leap. They call it Magic Wars. Then you have others that call it Mirror World. And then you have Google with Google Cloud Anchors, and then you have Microsoft with Azure Spatial Anchors, right? But the overall umbrella term is AR Cloud, Augmented Reality Cloud. And then you can do things like this, right? You have an understanding where your device is in the real world, and you can persist virtual content there, right? Like this guy here, or like this gentleman he's seeing this panel, right? And that is persisted there, always, if you want. So that's super powerful, and that will highly transform how we interact with the real world. And here's another example from a startup. So again, like lots of the big players working on that, as well as some startups like 60AI here. And they also do a good job explaining it. So if, if they see the guys walking around with their phones, right? So they're recording. All of them is like capturing a small portion. 
You see that, right? Just a little puzzle piece they're creating. And the power of the AR cloud is like bringing these puzzle pieces together to having this unified view, right? From all of these different devices. And so you, you have this kind of 3D scan, but it's not just the 3D scan. You actually then later know when you go back with a device where you are. And so it can load content that you placed there, that you persisted there. So you might ask, how do these devices perceive the real world? Well, something like this. This is recorded here on my Android phone. And uh, you can see it can reconstruct these uh, virtual planes. And then you can place yourself as a 3D scan there if you want. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's so AR Core and AR Kit can reconstruct these horizontal and vertical planes, right? They can see like flat surfaces like this, or like the floor or the wall. And then you can you put virtual content over there. Also works outdoors, so you can just annoy your neighbors a little bit. And uh, yeah, put that content over there. And the thing is, like each of these devices, like AOKit on iOS and AOCore on Android, as well as HoloLens 1 and 2, they all have these capabilities. But they all have different sensors. They all have different algorithms a little bit for this kind of tracking. And even like different Android models or the same like manufacturer, they might have different sensor calibration, right? And the power of the cloud is like bringing all of these isolated reconstructions together to have this unified merged view to actually then place a virtual content there. And you don't just want to place the virtual content there. You actually want to make it stay there. You want to persist it. You want to anchor it, right? You want to anchor the content there, which leads us to this concept of a spatial anchor. So let's talk about that a little bit. So just like a ship, you throw it at anchor, the ship won't move, right? But in our case, a spatial anchor is actually a coordinate system. And that coordinate system is being, well, that anchor is being tracked by the tracking system of the device. Like, again, all of these devices have some kind of tracking of runtime running. And so they will make sure that even if you move around, that pose, the orientation, and the position of that anchor is not moving. So it will stay there. It will be, uh, you know, stay at this position. And then you can attach virtual content to that and uh, you know, see that at this position. So that's, like I said, all of these devices supported AOKit, AOCore, HoloLens 1 and 2, Magic Leap. Magic Leap just calls it PCF, Persisted Coordinate Frame. But they all have this concept of an, a spatial anchor. And then we can talk about cloud spatial anchors, because the power of that is basically taking it from all these different devices and bringing them together. Again, different sensor data, different calibration a little bit on all of these devices. and. Um, yeah, a couple of companies working on that, like I mentioned. Google Cloud Anchors only supports sharing at the moment between iOS and Android. And Microsoft with Azure Spatial Anchors is really the furthest ahead here. They support HoloLens, ARKit, ARCore, and they even support persistence. So with Google Cloud Anchors, you just can do sharing. You need to be online all the time, basically. And these anchors are deleted after 24 hours. Microsoft with Azure Spatial Anchors, you can leave them as long as you want. And so here's the power of that with Azure Spatial Anchors and Cloud Spatial Anchor. You have this anchor on your device. It's uploaded to the cloud, Azure Spatial Anchors. Then your friend comes in with whatever device, downloads that anchor, and sees the virtual content at the exact same position. So you can enable these cross-platform shared experiences, right? And persistence. So even if you come back a week later, you rebooted the device, maybe switch devices, whatever, you can still load that content. You can still load the anchor and see the exact same content at the same position. All right, here's an example. Um, so take a look. That's, uh, first of all, I'm recording my Android phone here. So I'm created at Anchor, positioned this virtual sign with the company logo, uploaded that Anchor to ASA, Azure Spatial Anchors. Now what you can see here is the first person view recorded with the HoloLens. So I created the Anchor on the Android, downloaded that on the HoloLens, and see the same content at the exact same position. Right, as you can see here when I'm holding the phone in front, it's really at the same position. And again, as you notice, it's just using computer vision. So there's no GPS involved here. Because we get centimeter range precision with that, in fact. If we would use GPS, we would get meter range precision, right? Uh, in a real solution, you actually want to combine both. You want to say, OK, I use GPS to get a course approximation where I am. Then, OK, you can tell the API, give me all the anchors that are like, I don't know, 50 meters around me. Right? And then you get a really centimeter range position where you can position content. So cross-platform and sharing. And keep in mind, it's between a phone and this kind of head-mounted device, right? It's a totally different device category, in fact. Also, persistence is supported. So I was in uh, Seattle earlier this year and, um, you know, was running, uh, was, of course, trying out the uh, ASA stuff. And so I put a, a special anchor there at the Pike Place market pick and, uh, you know, persisted it. A couple of days later, came back 
and voila, it relocalized, right? So it found a position again. And take a look, I mean, the floor pattern changed quite a bit. It was raining, yeah, it was not raining. So a lot of different things for the computer vision to actually uh, keep, keep track of. And people walking around and all of that. So pretty impressive what they actually pulled off. And again, no GPS involved here, not at all. Just computer vision. So when I say computer vision and, you know, I say a lot of camera frames, you might ask about privacy, right? A lot of camera frames are taking. So what happens with that? I don't want to have my camera frames in the cloud, for sure. And um, I can speak for Microsoft and Azure Spatial Anchors. They put a really high emphasis on privacy and security. So here's what they actually do. So see that that's, this is the scene, basically. That's a lobby of a building. And what you can see here, these uh, rectangles with the red dots, these are the camera frames. So this is how the camera moves through the scene, right? And so what they do with these camera frames is they extract so-called feature points. And these are the green dots here. And the, all that set of feature points, that actually makes up a spatial anchor. And this is a so-called sparse point cloud. And what they do is they do all the pre-processing on the device. So all the camera frames are pre-processed on the device, and they just upload these set of feature points. That's only what they upload. For privacy reasons and also, of course, bandwidth, right? Much smaller. And then in the cloud, they actually store a spatial hash of that feature point set, which allows you to actually relocalize later on, you know, calculate the distance. A lot of advanced math involved here. But the good thing is they don't store camera frames, they don't store anything, and you can't, there's actually no known way to reconstruct from a spatial mesh into the 3D location, uh, into the 3D point cloud again. So again, you know, I can only speak for Microsoft. I don't know what Facebook is doing and Google and so on, right? They might actually do something else, but definitely um, Microsoft is not uploading any camera frames. Yeah, let's talk about some scenarios here. Uh, persisted multi-use of virtual content. So we can enable these kind of scenarios where we have uh, different people, like she's wearing a HoloLens to uh, different tablets, and they can see the exact same content there, right? And here's an app we built, which I'm going to show you in a second live which allows you to do that. So this is recorded straight on the Android phone. So he's scanning a little bit to get all these feature points to have enough data for the anchor, right? Because you need to give it a little bit of information. Scanning that space, then he creates this anchor. See that? And then take a look at the lady up there. And she is also scanning. She's now relocalizing the same anchor. So she has the reference position orientation. And then we integrated OneDrive so we can actually load 3D models uh, from your OneDrive cloud storage, so you can put them on your uh, computer, right, somewhere, and download them, and have these kind of, uh, you know, design reviews. And for example, here it's a, it's a kitchen sink, and so you can see uh, would that fit in. And now keep in mind, right, you have multiple people using whatever iOS, Android, Hololens. They can share the same content in real time. Plus, I can persist it. So if you have a meeting with someone, you want to show them, okay, would that fit in here? And one guy couldn't make it to the meeting. You could tell them, hey. Come back later, I just left the model there. You can, you can review it later, right? All righty, so let me show you a live demo. So here you can see the screen of my Android device. I'm going to launch an application here, well, the one I've just shown you. And what I'm going to do now, I'm, I'm going to start a session. So we have this concept integrated in this application like a session management, so you can have you know, multiple people join a session, basically, right? So it's now starting the session, and now it's asking me to scan the space. So I need to move the phone a little bit. It's reconstructing here the surfaces. As you can see, I'm getting a little bit of a visual overlay there. Now I have enough data. I can load a OneDrive model. So let me see what I'm going to use here. I'll just use the company logo. So now I'm going to place the anchor visual here. So let's create the anchor. Now it's actually downloading the model. It's created the anchor. The internet is a little bit slow here. Actually, the model is not that large, but there we go. You have it here, and then we can you know, manipulate it real time, move it, scale it, and so you know, it will stay down. So that's just common with AR Core and AR Kit, right? But again, I could have like someone of you join a session with the exact same model showing at the same position. And let me show you persistence. So when I exit the session, I could say, do I want to save session? Yep. So what I do here, I can actually take a snapshot like this so I know where I was, give it a name. Hey, build stuff, save that. Now it's uploading the session to our cloud storage, basically. Now I could load it, 
Well, actually, let me show you the real deal. I'm closing the app, right? You see that? Close the app. I'm going to relaunch. Load that previous session. It's loading now the sessions. Again, internet is a little bit slow. So it fetches in the, the screenshots as well. I load Hey Build Stuff, the one I just created. Loading the session. Now it tells me, OK, I should scan you know, to actually get the feature points for the reference location. So and now you see it actually found the anchor there. It's automatically downloading the model. And there we go, at the exact same position I placed it. right? So we persisted as well. All right, cool. Glad the demo worked. So we can enable these kind of you know, cross-platform sharing and persistence scenarios. Let's talk about wayfinding for a little bit. So with Azure Spatial Anchors, you have these so-called cloud anchor session. And if you create multiple anchors in one session, they actually get connected with each other as a graph. So that's pretty cool, because you can then enable wayfinding scenarios. And so think about this scenario. There's like a big facility with lots of machines. And they have a certain failure, right? And there's an engineer in the control room that sees like a blinking LED. Hey, this machine has a failure. What they need to do now is they need to scroll through lots of control room panels, look into manuals, blueprints, whatever. Now think about if we would enable them with a modern tech like computer vision and Azure Spatial Anchors, they could pull out their phone or put on a whole lens, hold it in front of the panel, it recognizes what kind of machine is failing, pulls in the dynamic wayfinding information, and then we could show them a green line or arrows to guide them to the machine. They find it much faster. And then on the machine, we can show them real-time repair instructions. Right? And that might save a few minutes, or even if it's just saving seconds, that's a huge cost saving for lots of these facilities, because it costs 100,000 euros if they shut down for a couple of seconds. Right? But there's definitely lots of cost saving potential here. Um, here's another consumer scenario. Think about a spatial aware grocery list. Like if you go to a supermarket and need to buy stuff, you typically have this kind of list. Maybe you have it, maybe not. But, you know, guess what I did? My wife gave me this list here, so yeah, go buy the stuff. But, yeah, okay, yeah. So I used the application, and you can, we'll get that as open source at the end of the session, like I mentioned. So I can create these spatial sticky notes. I can create whatever text and, and place it there. So, you know, put it there. You know what, I would be so happy if she would actually use it, because when I uh, go grocery shopping, I always struggle to find the stuff, because I don't go that often. It's always nerve wracking. I hate it. Anyway. Um, so we can create these kind of uh, spatial wire information. And now think about if you want to share it with the store. Again, by default, it's all just in your own Azure tenant and all very secure. But if you want to share it with the store, or if the store offers such kind of application, they could maybe analyze that and then could say, hey, we noticed you buy that product very often. Here's a $2 discount, boof, right at the object, right? Or you could say they have just certain base objects, and then you have certain accessories that you can then sample as augmented reality. So a lot of value for the brick and mortar stores that have been struggling with online retail competition that have these hyper-personalized data available, right? And so these advanced AR scenarios might be a little bit of a benefit for those. So we just talked about visual content on top of these anchors. But in fact, like I mentioned, the anchor is really just orientation and position. So we could also place audio content on top of that. Your next meeting is right? with Juliet and so here's an app from like Microsoft called yes. Seeing AI, part of their AI for Good initiative, where they actually yes. just integrated Azure Spatial Anchors for wayfinding. So she's scanning, finding the initial position basically, right? Loading the data. And then it's Follow using a technology called spatial sound, which, you know, if you're wearing stereo headsets, you can actually locate where sound is coming from in 3D. You know where the sound, you know where to go. So that's what I integrated here. And uh, use that technology basically for wayfinding for people that are blind or low vision. Pan your phone to map the room. Table at 12 o'clock, empty seat located at 11 o'clock. Hey, glad you're here. Let's get started. I really love this kind of stuff, because this is, I mean, if we can use modern technology to build this diverse and inclusive environment and help everyone to be part of that, yeah, I'm totally in. Like, this is really what I'm excited about, using that technology to make, make this inclusive environment, right? And you can also do fun things like uh, navigating large areas like uh, museums, festivals, theme parks. And here's an example from my friends in Studio 05 in the Netherlands. And they made this concept, so it's just a concept video, but I'm in fact actually talking with them now to uh, make that a reality with Agile Spatial Anchors, because now we have the technology to make that not just a concept, but for real. So you have your favorite theme park figure guiding you through the theme park, and we could also pull in dynamic information like waiting times. If you go right, 40 minutes, of course you go left, 
plus 15 minutes and follow the guy. And now think about you're actually then waiting in line. You could have some virtual up characters persisted there. You can play a game with them on your phone. Then you have other people waiting in line. You can have a shared experience and do a lot of uh, amazing things actually with that. Yep. So a lot of uh, potential for engaging customer experiences. And urban morals and, and digital art. So we really can make the whole world a canvas. And so here's a nice graffiti I saw in LA which is, you know, you see these two business guys trying to solve each other, you know, cracking the code. And it's kind of ruined with this public parking sign you have up there, right? And so why not bring in some virtual content and make it a little bit nicer, like our good old friend Clippy. <laughs> and we can even have Clippy in 3D now, since we're talking AR, right? Who remembers Clippy? Oh, that's good, at least. Like, I was giving a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, like there was just two people in the audience, so it didn't land that well, but glad you still know Clippy. But anyway, uh, so, joke aside, really seriously, if you look at all these social media applications, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, they have a big, big push on AR filters. A lot of them are these face filters, but Snapchat also has these kind of landmarks, but they just have some hand-picked landmarks, like Eiffel Tower and so on, just very special pieces. And basically, Snapchat is saying that 70% of their users use AR filters every day. So it's a huge market. And with technology like this, with the AR cloud, and here in this case, Azure Spatial Anchors, you can create really persistent virtual objects there. So you cannot just take a photo or video and share that. You can actually tell your friend, hey, go there, I left something for you. So you can also create games, right? Because this technology just screams games in the end, right? Think about scavenger hunt, hide and seek games. So much potential here. And so I built this little. Fruit hunt game, you know, place fruits all over the place, like the virtual banana right next to the sidewalk. Good thing is, I persisted it there, good thing is no one will slip on the virtual banana, but that's good. And so you can play these games, right, and, and you know, kind of, it democratizes our, our AR uh, location-based game development. And you know what, Microsoft's actually using their own technology for this here, Minecraft Earl. And so they're taking the Minecraft brand, and bringing that to augmented reality. So you can actually play these Minecraft adventures in the real world with your friends on different mobile devices. And you can they even persist these scenarios, right? And if you compare it to like Pokemon Go from the Antic or the Harry Potter thing they have, it's just using GPS. So you really don't have precise enough location to really play it in the same spot, right? But with this technology, with Azure Spatial Anchors, for example, you can see it really spot on in a centimeter range position. So you can play these adventures together. Uh, they just launched in beta, um, so if you can sign up if you want, you might get an invite and uh, you know, give it a try. And again, they're using their own tech, Azure Spatial Anchors, which is of course helping us all because it's improving the service in the end, right? Um, but yeah, pretty exciting stuff. And cool thing is the technology is available, everyone can build similar things. Um, yeah, it's available for HoloLens, iOS, and Android, like I mentioned, uh, with Unity, and also you can go low level, of course, uh, if you want to go native. Um, we are using Unity because it's just providing us cross-platform support um, pretty easily. All righty, so here are my top 10 list again. Treat the HoloLens, uh, well, you heard it a long time, and these are the resources I mentioned, so you might want to take a photo of that. So this is my name, feel free to connect on LinkedIn, whatever, here's my Twitter handle, my blog, I will post the slides and all of the, this stuff on my blog as well. Uh, this is the demo code I've shown you with the object recognition, right, where it was running on the HoloLens. Here's another sample where it's integrating a custom vision AI model trained in the cloud. And um, then is a longer talk about ASA, Azure Spatial Anchors, and the demo code here, like I've shown you, so you can get it here on GitHub. And here below, if you have never done deep learning or deep neural networks, highly recommend these kind of videos. Really short, not very long, and provided not just you know, in this kind of PhD level style, but a little very nicely and visual if you want to learn about deep learning, right? All right, yeah. with that, we're right on time here, I think. Um, I will stick around till tomorrow, so if you have any questions, we might have a few minutes here to answer them. But again, I will be around, so just approach me, ask. You can also see my email, Twitter handle. Feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. I hope you have a good rest of the conference. <laughs>